We're here at Life Today TV talking to Jay Richards, author of the book Money, Greed, and God. Uh, Jay, thanks for being with us. Hey, it's great to be with you. And, and I got to say that's an interesting pairing of, of <laughs> words um, because, you know, the Bible talks a lot about money, mm -hmm. and finances, a whole lot, yeah. but not so much about an economic system. Yeah. And in fact, I, I grew up hearing that the only true communist system was in the Bible. <laughs> Is, is that really true? Is that is that the way it works? You know, it's not true. And you're probably thinking about Acts 2, in sure. which the, the early church in Jerusalem is described as basically selling their possessions and holding everything in common. And people think this is an early sort of experiment in communism. It's really nothing like communism. If you look at how communism worked in the 20th century, you have a powerful, all-powerful government confiscating private property, redistributing it at will. In the early church in, in Jerusalem, you've got a small group of Christians voluntarily selling their things and holding everything in common. That voluntary versus coercive is a crucial distinction because you don't have the Roman government showing up any, uh, anywhere. But the other thing to realize is that you aren't dealing with something that's considered normative for all churches. Even at the time, it's not like the church in Thessalonica or Ephesus was described as doing things in this way. What I really think is going on is that the early church in Jerusalem is in a, a unique situation. Remember, right at Pentecost, Jews from all around the known world uh, converge on Jerusalem. Thousands of them become Christians. Suddenly they're away from home. They don't have possessions. They don't have a job. They don't have uh, housing. And so given that sort of temporary situation, it made sense for those, especially the local Christians in Jerusalem, to sell their things and to hold everything in common. But it was certainly not a communist experiment. It was a type of voluntary communal living, kind of like monks in a monastery. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really important to realize that this, is, this is not communism. Now, you mentioned, though, also this idea of, you know, does the Bible have an economic system? Sure. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, obviously the Bible's not an economics textbook. Economics is a social science that's been developed in the last few centuries. So we shouldn't expect that, you know, the Bible's going to necessarily address directly, every, you know, some question about Keynesian economics, <laughs> you know. But I, I would argue that the, the foundational principles uh, that are foundational f to free market economics, to capitalism, are well represented in Scripture. For instance, probably above everything, Thing, the right to private property. You can't have a free market unless people have a right to private property that's respected by other people and even by the government. If you think about it, two of the Ten Commandments assume the right to private property. You know, thou shalt not steal. That wouldn't make sense unless people legitimately had possessions that were theirs, that mm -hmm. couldn't be taken from them. And then thou shalt not covet. You know, that people have different amounts of things. Some people are richer than others, and we're told not to covet the possessions of others. And so it's one of those things that's everywhere assumed in Scripture, though nowhere directly addressed. Well, now that's Old Testament. Didn't Jesus change things when he came in and he told the rich young ruler to sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Well, he did say that, uh, but it's not changing everything. Remember, Jesus also said that, you know, uh, not, not one iota, not uh, one jot would pass away until the kingdom of God came. So Jesus was a fulfillment of the Old Testament. We didn't come to abolish it. Uh, but Jesus was sp speaking specifically in that situation, as you said, to the rich young ruler. But notice he isn't described as having said that to anyone else, right? right. He, Jesus spoke unique and specific words to people based on his knowledge of their situation. Obviously, in this case, the rich young ruler uh, was owned, was controlled by his wealth. Mm -hmm. Jesus discerned that, and he knew this guy would never be free spiritually unless he was free of his possessions. And so in that one man's case, uh, it turns out mammon was his God. God, mm -hmm. Jesus knew that, and he said, you know, get rid of everything you have and come follow me. Well, what did the rich young ruler do? He turned away, right? So Jesus was right. That, in, in fact, right there, uh, face to face with the Son of God, uh, when asked to make a decision between his possessions and Jesus, he chose his profession. So, so it was more a lesson of, of thou shalt have no other gods before me. Absolutely. I mean, Jesus talks about money all through the Gospels. Paul talks about it in his letters. Jesus says, you know, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Right. It didn't say that money is intrinsically evil or that someone who's wealthy is intrinsically bad because of that. It said it can become a God and we can serve it. And that's not what we're supposed it, to do. Isn't, though, anyone that's rich obviously greedy? Well, I mean, this is what we sometimes think, obviously. But, you know, I mean, we all have known people that, you know, I had friends in college that had absolutely nothing that could do, you know, spend all their time coveting the wealth of others. They're obviously very greedy, and there's a lot of very rich people that sit loosely on their wealth and are quite generous. Now, sure, whenever you have wealth, you have great responsibility. There's a lot, a lot of temptations that come with that. Uh, but it's not the possession of wealth that's the crucial spiritual issue. It's what you do with it. You know, uh, Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil. That's different from saying money itself is the root of all evil. Was Jesus rich? 
Well, you know, it's funny because, I mean, uh, it depends on what you mean by rich. The truth of the matter is rich and poor are more or less relative terms. And so, I mean, most people in the ancient world, by our standards, would have been poor, right? Sure. I mean, no one had indoor plumbing, and certainly that's the sort of mark of poverty. There's no evidence that the, the disciples, in particular, and Jesus, were impoverished, at least according to the standards of the time. They, they clearly had enough food. They're described as, you know, Jesus is describing as having kept the purse. Jesus stayed in people's homes. They certainly had an itinerant, itinerant life, mm -hmm. uh, but Peter had a, a fishing business back home. And so I think um, it, it's tempting to sort of impose a pious understanding that all these guys were impoverished. What they clearly were is uh, they sat loosely on their wealth. So whatever they had, their, their uh, needs were met, but clearly their priorities weren't in, you know, uh, wealth creation. So, so what does all this mean to us today, to the average Christian? Obviously, we, we shouldn't serve mammon, as you right. say. You know, money must not be our God. Yeah. But how, what kind of attitude towards economics is a proper Christian attitude to have? Well, I think that we should think about economics as part of reality. It's one part of God's world. In fact, if you just think about your own life, a lot of what you do has an economic component, where you live, where you send your kids to school, your job, you know, how you pay your bills. All these things are economic. And so if the gospel has implications for all of life, it's going to have to have implications for economics. And so I think we need to apply the Christian world to economics just as we do to the institution of marriage or uh, abortion or any of these things. Uh, the other thing, though, is that we're called to be concerned about the poor. God cares yeah. about the poor and he expects yeah. us to be. And this is why I got interested in the subject. But, you know, we often talk about, well, the nature of poverty or what causes poverty. But there's only one cure for economic poverty, and it's economic wealth. And so the question we ought to be asking is, how is wealth created? If we're really concerned about the poor, we want to know how do, how do people in poor parts of the world uh, create the institutions that give rise to wealth creations that we enjoy here? And that's a question I think we're, we're, we're called to ask. It's an economic question. We're called to ask it precisely because we're called to care about the poor. I thought that wealth was only to be shared. You're saying it can be created? It can be created. In fact, that's a, one of the best ways to share it. I mean, people forget, but you know, Bill Gates is now a great philanthropist, but before he was a great philanthropist, he was creating wealth, billions of dollars of wealth, both for himself and for millions of other people. Um, and too often as Christians, we, we, the only thing we think of is how are we going to distribute the wealth that's already there, like this, you know, it's pie right, on the table right. and the best we can do is sort of slice it up. Right, right. Uh, the question is where'd that pie come from in the first place and how do we grow the pie? Yeah. That, that's the prior question. Interesting. What do you recommend Christians do to maybe understand a little bit more about how economics affects their lives and how their Christian worldview should affect their economic activities and, and outlooks? Yeah, I mean, it, it, for a lot of people, if people ask me about financial advice, I actually say, actually go read Dave Ramsey. I mean, he's the, sure. he's the expert on that. I'm not. Uh, what I've tried to do in this book, Many Agree to God, is, is help Christians overcome sort of intellectual hurdles, what right. I call myths that I've found work their way into our thinking, into the thinking of almost all of us if we're not careful. And I argue that if you get over these myths and learn to recognize them when you see them in your own thinking and in the media, uh, you can think your way through and think clearly about virtually any economic issue that you uh, would, would care to consider. And so that's, you know, frankly what the book is about. It's not an economics textbook. It's a book designed to help us think clearly as Christians about wealth and poverty. Interesting. Interesting. Not something you typically hear from the church pulpit. No, it's you not. Know. I mean, we tend to think that this is a political issue, but, but it's not a political issue. Very important in our lives. Well, where, can they, where can people get your book? Uh, Amazon.com, mm -hmm. uh, probably the easiest place, or Barnes & Noble or Borders. And, and do you have a website? Uh, I do, actually. It's the Discovery Institute website at discovery.org. Excellent. Thank you for being with us and for giving us a little economics lesson. Maybe we can learn to be a little more savvy in this area. Thanks. Great to be with you. Thank you.